Hello and welcome to Big Jet TV and a very special historic show here at the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre in East Kirkby. Today we'll be showcasing a classic aircraft Lancaster NX611 Just Jane. We'll be meeting up with one of the volunteers, Spen, who'll be showing us around the inside of the aircraft and then we'll be watching her start up those four Rolls-Royce engines and following her out on one of her taxi runs. Well that's all to come, but before all the action starts and they wheel her out of the hangar, I managed to catch up with curator Andrew Panton, who explains the history of Just Jane and East Kirkby. I'm Andrew Panton, uh, General Manager of the Aviation Museum here at East Kirkby. I taxi both the Lancaster and the Mosquito. East Kirkby here was originally RAF East Kirkby. It flew with uh, Lancaster squadrons, 57 and 630 squadrons. So Fred and Harold Panton, Fred's my grandfather, they had a brother flying Halifax bombers during the Second World War with Bomber Command. Unfortunately he was lost on the Nuremberg Raid in March 1944. So they really wanted a lasting memorial to him and to all of Bomber Command. And when the Lancaster came up for sale they purchased her, purchased the land here at East Kirkby and brought it all together to, to form the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre. We have a team of around eight engineers that work on the aircraft. There's there's about three of them that are volunteers, uh, all the rest are actually paid um, engineers, so we have a, a big team actually working towards the restoration of the Lancaster. Um, she's currently in a taxiing condition, uh, we made her taxiing in 1995, so she runs under her own engines with her own brakes, um, and we've started the scheme of returning her to airworthiness, um, which is a 10 year plan, and we're currently in year three. So what we're doing is we're doing six months of restoration work, where we focus on a rear fuse last section. Um, and then we have six months of taxiing to raise the funds to then spend on the restoration work. The Aviation Centre is on a Bomber Command airfield that is primarily about RAF Bomber Command during World War II. So we've got the Lancaster here which is live, so it taxis. We also have a Mosquito here which served with the 100 Group, which is also live and taxiing now. That particular aircraft is owned by Tony Agar. Um, we have various other aircraft under restoration including uh, Handley Page Hamden. We've got quite a unique collection of World War II RAF vehicles as well, including the, the only known crew bus, uh, Fordson Watt 1 crew bus. So with it being on an original wartime airfield with the original Lancaster, original equipment, it's like stepping back in time as you come back to the, uh, the museum here. We've got the original control tower set up as it was during wartime and the uh, majority of the buildings here are all original wartime buildings. Not necessarily in the original position, but we've brought them here from various neighbouring airfields and sites uh, to really recreate a uh, bomber airfield as it was. So with the uh, local village of East Kirkby, there's also RAF Coningsby nearby, which is the home to the Battle of Issa Memorial Flight. There's also um, Woodhall Spa, which um, housed 617 Squadron Officers Mess, which was at the Petwood Hotel, which you can also visit and see some of the displays there from uh, Bomber Command as well. You can go to our website, which is linksaviation.co.uk. From there, you can book a taxi ride on the Lancaster, you can book a tour, you can just buy tickets to events. We have a lot of um, air show and reenactment events around the, uh, through the calendar as well. You could book a winter tour, so you can come and see the restoration work uh, happening. So really, all the information is on our website, linksaviation.co.uk. Okay, so thanks to Andrew for explaining all the uh, history of Just Jane and of course this wonderful live museum at East Kirkby. Okay, they've wheeled her out of the hangar and uh, they're going through some final checks at the moment, checking the fluid levels. We'll be getting on to the action in a little while, but before we do that, let's go and meet up with Spen, who's going to take us on a tour around this wonderful aircraft. Yes, so you've got, here we've got, uh, here we've got the rear turret, you'll notice that we've got two guns on this one. These are 50 cals. Um, if you see it, if you see a turret with four guns on, they are the uh, the 303s. That was a little pea shooter Bolton and Paul, wasn't it? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is because this is quite a late aircraft. You've got you've got all the, all the upgraded systems on this one. Yeah. So uh, a much happier um, a rear gunner for sure. Well, he was a bit more devastated when it hit something. Definitely. Yeah. For yes. sure. Yes. I believe they used to remove the rear the, the the perspex out of the rear turrets as well. Sometimes, yeah, for him to get a better view. And of course, very cold conditions as well. Oh, very cold. Minus yes. thirty odd. Oh yes. These well, are the guys that wore, wore heated suits, didn't they? Heated suits, heated gloves. Yes. But even so, it's still it's still cold up there. Yeah. Definitely. And the loneliest place on a bomber? Yeah, tail end Charlie, usually, sadly, usually the first guy to go when, when everything kicked off. Um, but strangely enough, he was the one who had the easiest means of exit. Yes. Because um, all he had to do was swivel his turret around 90 degrees and he could just fall out the back. And just make sure his ch his chute is, well is within reach. As long as reach. he remembered to pitch, pick up his chute on the way past. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the flare chute, isn't it? Uh, That's the flare chute, yes. So that would be um, where they would drop um, 
coloured flares. Coloured flares, yes, or because when this was used by the French as a, uh, a maritime aircraft, possibly sonar boys. Yes, right, I see, yes. And they had all kinds of uh, different, um, for the evening, uh, the raids uh, for the Pathfinders, like Wangui and stuff like that. Yeah, they, just, they, they, they had a huge, a huge, they, they called them strange names, I miss. <laughs> yes. So as you can appreciate, folks, it's, uh, it's a tight squeeze in here, right, looking down into the rear turret. So the, we've got the entrances literally just slide straight down there. He slides down that pad. That once he's in, he closes two little doors behind him, little doors at the side there. Yes. And uh, he's in, and he's in there for the trip. Is that an electric operated turret? No, it's that, hydraulic, it, that's it? hydraulic. Yeah, the front and rear turrets on this aircraft are hydraulic. Everything that's on the aircraft now was on the aircraft while it was at Scampton. A lot of people will be like, why have you got a pigeon, a pigeon? in yes. the box? It's quite interesting. Sometimes in a ditching situation yes. where they'd send the, uh, yes. send the pigeon, yeah. with they're their coming position. across the channel and uh, they've only got a couple of miles to go and they have to yeah. ditch it. And yeah. yeah, with their position on it. And send there were actually, pigeon. there were actually uh, quite a lot of, um, I believe, cases where the pigeons actually saved quite a few lives. Apparently so, yes, yes, yes. There's quite a few pigeons actually, I think, got the dicky medal. Yes, For yes. that kind of thing, yeah. Now this is, uh, this is for the compass, it I believe. Is, it is, this is the, uh, I'll read it off the side here and get it right. It's the repeater reading master unit. Right. Okay, yes. so that's the... So it's, it's basically... It's, it's a gyroscopic... It's a gyroscopic yeah. compass. It's, yeah. I mean, it, the, the, it's falling off. Isn't it? Yes, of course, but yeah. Um, but it's fully gimbaled. And moving forward, moving okay, forward. so that's the H2S uh, the cover for the H2S. Right. Is that yeah. the, the actual... Yeah, this is the inspection. Yes, if, you, if we were to take this off, you'd be able to see the radar unit itself, the scanner. Yes. It's a Mark II version of the British H2S. So this was actually used as what we call an air-to-surface vessel uh, radar. So they're actually looking for uh, submarine periscopes and that kind of thing. You can see that the inside of this aircraft is truly authentic. Now this pipe running through here, this is this the heating pipe? This is the heating system, yes. And that would have been drawn off of, of one of the... Uh, the yeah, that, uh, that is drawn from uh, behind the starboard leading edge. I see. Okay, yeah, so from the engine, so heat, heat from, from the, the engine. engine. Yeah, so yeah. Yes. Okay, so just the heat from the engine, not the exhaust, obviously. Yeah. And uh, these are, are these flares here? These, these are the flares, yes. Although these these are dummy ones. Yeah. Yeah. So different coloured flares, and I would imagine they'd have a berry pistol on board as well. Yeah. So in some circumstances where the um, one of the crew would fire the uh, the a, a particular colour as they're approaching to sh say that they've got um, da uh, uh, injured personnel on board yeah, or... Yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, this is obviously the mid-upper turret the section, the, the, so the normally section. we yeah. would have had a... Um, this would have gone all the way to the ground, wouldn't it? Yes. I think, um, yes. with yeah. a, big, a, a big rotating That's right, uh, yeah. section yeah. where he would sit yeah. in it and there would be a seat in there and everything. In fact, the, the, the turret that goes in here is actually on a, on a maintenance stand in the hangar. And good for, for, the, for the taxi ride. You get a lovely view. Yeah, you yes. get a fantastic yeah. view. So we're now coming up, this is the, this is the screw for the, uh, for the flaps, isn't it? I believe. This is the hydraulic ram. It's okay. hydraulic. Yeah. Yeah, that operates the flaps. So this is coming up from behind the, the starboard wing and then feeding off in that direction. Where the Rebecca indicator is on this one, yes. uh, you'll see that's where the H2S indicator okay. is. These, uh, these items here, and there's two more here, are the uh, voltage regulators from the, um, from the generators on the engines. And that, of course, is emergency air. That, of course, is a fire extinguisher. And you've got uh, those, uh, you've got the hydraulic tank Something that is vulnerable to attack, I have to say. Yeah, you get a bullet through that, your hydraulics are out. Okay, so this is the uh, radio operator this station. This is the radio operator station, yes. And that's all the um, the original set by the looks of it. It is, it is. These are original. Is that the, um, and the trailing aerial? Where would the trailing aerial, is that the, is that the set over there, that one with the switches on it? Is that, that one there? It's just got the knob on the end of it. It's just a yeah. big lock yeah. that sticks out. Yes, yeah. yeah. And that's your, um, and that is your, the drift indicator, the left and right, That's is that? right, yeah. Yeah, that's the drift indicator. And more flares, of course. Okay, let's move forward up to the business end. Now I'm definitely going over the spa now. Okay. Now imagine climbing over that. Yeah. You're in full kit. Yeah. Um, 
the captain's bought it or the aircraft is on fire and you've got to get out quickly. Yeah. Okay, so now this is the uh, navigator station. Right. So this is this is this the, would be the H2S set. This would be. Yes. But in this aircraft this is this is the Rebecca. Yes. Right, which is the which is the yeah, the the, you know, the, okay. the landing aid. Um, other than that, everything else is pretty uh, fairly, authentic, yeah, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. That's his uh, plotting desk. It is. It's, it's He's actually, sitting there for the full flight. He would be. He'd have a little seat that swung out from underneath here. And yes. He sat here, so he's got his, his desk light. He's got his light for the for the repeater instruments because he needs to know how fast they're going and what height they're at. Yes. Because he's going to be doing. Um, all the navigation calculations. He'd be there with his stopwatch, yes. and he'd be saying, "Right, we're doing we're doing sort of uh, 200 knots. Right, so in, in 10 minutes we need you know 20 degrees port, 20 degrees starboard, or whatever, yes. to go onto the next heading. You can then calculate on here what your drift is, and then you can tell the pilot. They'll give it just a little bit of rudder. Flight engineer's panel right here. He's going to be keeping a check on the." Engine temperatures, oil temperatures, I guess. Yes. The red ones here, are they fuel cocks? They, they're, 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 um, they're, they're fuel cocks, yes. Yeah. What you can do with those um, uh, is you can actually use them to transfer fuel from one yes. tank to another. So, you know, if you've got a hole in your port number two, yes. you can transfer it into the start number two. Yes. Let's just have a little look down into the, uh, the bomb aimer's position. Obviously, um, uh, now sometimes uh, I believe that the the bomb aimer would double up as the uh, front gunner. Is That's that right? Correct. Yes. Yes. And, and the course. He doesn't need to be the bomb aimer all the time. So no, no. He only needs to be the bomb aimer for about five minutes. Yes. Um, and there's all his, his equipment down there, and of course the uh, the bomb sites and so on and so forth. And that's the computer down there, I believe. Okay, the, that square item. Yes, that, yes. That's the bombing computer. Yes. And if you just, I'm not, well, I'll shine my torch on it. Okay. That round. Yeah, that round thing there. That is a Sperry autopilot. Ah, it's just to uh, give the pilot a bit of rest on on the twelve-hour missions. I see. Um, I see. So that would that, that would give them sort of a uh, continuous heading and continuous height. Okay, so once again, um, all authentic front end here uh, in the in the flight yes, deck. Yes. Yes. This is. Uh, his compass over there. That's the G4B compass. Yes, that's the if you like. That's the um, that's the well, yeah. There we go. Yes. That's the that's the emergency. So when all else fails, yes. At least he's got a basic compass. Yes. To get him home. Now that particular style of compass was quite common in RAF aircraft, right up um, until sort of the mid 60s. Now a lot of people may be asking. Well, hold on a minute. I've seen Lancasters with uh, two pilot seats in them, uh, and again, this is purely authentic. Um, they may be mistaking it perhaps with BBMF's Lancaster, which yes. has to have uh, uh, a two pilots I do position, so, yes. seat and obviously two control columns yes. as well. Yeah. So is that something that, that, that will eventually happen to this aircraft? We do have the kit to retrofit, if you'll excuse the, the rhyme. Um, yeah, we've, uh, it's, it's something that uh, is in, in the pipeline. Yes. But at the moment, uh, because you can imagine um, it's a bit awkward for people to get down the front on a taxi run. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I guess so that'll kind of block it off once it's uh, it, once it it's moved up to a point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right out there are uh, two uh, beautiful Merlin engines. Obviously the port side, and then starboard side over there. And of course uh, these engines have been fully restored. Uh, right, okay, well, there we go. Thank you, Sven, so no much. Um, You're welcome. You are now famous, <laughs> and um, we really appreciate your time. You can go and have your breakfast now. Lovely job. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. That's two to number two tanks. That's it. Think we're happy for Prime, John? Yeah, yeah, fine. Talk to the fireman. Right, uh, radio call of five. Uh, five one is that right? Try radio check. Right, receiving your landing clearance. Sir. Right, John. What we do is while they're priming, uh, switch your your starboard number two boot to one. Then eat, open these. So your number three for five seconds, shut it, number four, five seconds, shut it.
And the carry switch up uh, across, so this, it, the guard is away, and then these kids come up to there, and then this the guard. And the brakes are good, they're at 300. Give Andrew a signal.
Okay, so there you go then, folks. Uh, what a fantastic example of a working Lancaster bomber these guys have here at East Kirkby. Thanks once again to all the hard-working volunteers and, of course, to uh, the staff here who've laid this on for us. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next time. office tower right here one of the original um, big tall buildings built here in London so that's commonly seen over London watching from Cape Town good morning to you so that's how close to Harrods we are guys Knightsbridge heart of London beautiful architecture would love to come to London Harmic Vascanian good day to you my friend so all these guys uh, sitting out on their roofs. Give us a wave, boys. Here we go, look. Good lads. Here they come. Okay, so this is the for first formation of uh, what looks like the choppers. Oh, right, okay. Here we go, guys. Get sharing. And uh, last comment I just saw there was thank you to the RAF from the Royal Canadian Air Force. Of course, the RC RCAF, who played a huge part in the Second World War over here. Specifically with Bomber Command. So here we go, here's the first wave, what looks like choppers. Wow, look at this. Okay.
They have trained for many, many weeks on this, guys. So, big shout out to all the crews who work tirelessly to bring this to us. You should start to hear them. Uh, Chinooks in there. right now so they should be passing overhead here we go DC-3 playing a huge role in the landings. Oh, look at this. BBMF Lancaster flanked by Spitfires and Hurricanes. So I've filmed some amazing things for Big Jet TV, but that about 
puts the cherry on top of the icing on top of the cake. Wow. Here's your trainers. It's another group. comes at 3.30. Tanker, I believe. this high speed high speed this is that little um, RC reconnaissance uh, search and rescue beautiful and right behind him a wax with the radar operational. Normally flying at high, high altitudes, this one. Is it? 
Looks like it is. Another wave of reds. Formation slightly, but these look like the uh, tornadoes. Look at that, man. Hey, that's what you call a format. And there's your 22 tornadoes. Or typhoons. guys I've got no director on scene with me today so I couldn't switch back for that so so it is uh, it is impressive how they put this together isn't it yeah using 90% I think of the uh, yeah. of the original engine yeah. it's all stock 1943 configuration basically apart from the radiator of course yes and the glycol radiator yeah there's a few modifications yes yeah, yeah. And obviously the propeller blades on the Halifax would have been wooden originally. Yes, and longer. Yeah, and longer, yeah. Yeah, yeah these ones are actually sort of aluminium blades and they're from a, a sea fire. So um, they have to be cut down obviously because we don't want it to take yeah, too much ground, of a bite into the slipstream yeah, yeah, of and course. ground clearance yeah. as well. Um, what is interesting and what, 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 what people will notice when, uh, when, she, when she does fire up is um, how quiet she is compared to the normal exhaust, um, the stubbed exhaust of uh, that we're used to when we were up at Lincolnshire. Oh, that's right. Uh, these um, saxophone exhausts, they were designed primarily for flame suppression when the bombers were operating. I heard that. I must have been, but then again, but they do also act as a bit well, of if it's on a Mustang, it must be later yeah, engines as well. That kind of you know, side um, yes. What you've got basically is the exhaust yeah. coming out into these exhaust ports here and collecting in this chamber. Um, it's then sort of having a chance to cool down a little bit before it sort of then gets ejected out through the back part of the exhaust there. And of course, it is the flame that they're trying to suppress. Yeah, would you imagine at night time the bomber operating on pitch black to any night fighter? Those flames coming out, four rows of exhausts, you know, are going to stand out quite a long way on a clear night. Yes, especially eight of them. Yeah. yeah. So they don't need any, you know, disadvantages like that. Yeah. 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 But so the um, so the 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 the, uh, the carcass of the engine, the casing itself, yeah. is uh, it managed to withstand, or have, have you? Uh, was there uh, extensive repairs done to that, or there were some repairs done, some minor sort of cracks and things that have been welded by specialists um, up in Leeds. Oh yeah, you need to go. And there's very few people around who can do that kind of work. Yes. Luckily, he can. Yes. Um, 
It's all the original engine casing, the only thing that didn't survive the, the, the engine tunnel, the oil tunnel at the bottom. I see, yes, of course, it would, uh, that, that would have, um, yeah. So where did you manage to source that from? Um, well, this one was kindly donated by his birthday. Oh, really? Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. So we are, we are sort of indebted to them for that. Yes, most definitely. Of course, I guess um, I, I guess back in the day, the uh, uh, changing of the um, the seals and so on and so forth on these on these sumps wouldn't have been a massive uh, of, of massive importance to the ground crews, uh, that, which is why we saw so much oil on the dispersals. Um, it would be more so the componentry, making sure the engines were working. Um, um, with these kind of engines, if you didn't get a bit of oil leakage, then there was a concern yeah, yeah, more yeah. than having a concern that it is leaking. Yes, yes. And what is interesting, I know we've touched on this uh, earlier, is, is, the, is the framework. The fact that, um, you know, that's all original. The original frame from JD 150. Yeah. Really. Yeah, yeah. All the ignition harness, everything's uh, everything's all, all original. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You're right on the audio, Jilly. Do you want me to switch the mic? Okay, I've switched the mic around here. We can't hear you too well, Kevin. Okay. Okay, right. I've, uh, I've switched the mic around. So, uh, so you should yeah, be well, I was just saying that better audio. Yeah, carry on, sir. The, the prop hub's original, the blades are replacements, and as you said earlier, of course, they've been sawn down. And originally, the Halifax would have had variable pitch propellers. This uh, it would be variable pitch, but it's fixed in one position because it's almost fixed in a feathering position. It's taken a small bite, but not too much because that will give it the forward thrust and we don't want that on a yes. static engine. Yes. Yeah. Oh no no it's not for me. This chair's not for me. So um So is the supercharger actually uh is is it actually operational whilst you're firing it up? Is it actually uh it's not really a, 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 this not kind of op maximum operating no yeah uh, bearing in mind we ha have to restrict the RPM on this because you can't put it up to full RPM even though it's fairly rigid in the stand. Yes. You know, we can't put it to takeoff power. Yeah. yeah. So we restrict it to about 2000 RPM maximum. Uh, most of the time we run it a bit less than that. Yeah. And uh, I can see that we're missing the starter. Is that where the starter would have been there? Um, that was, I think, the generator. Oh, the generator, yeah. right. Okay, okay. But you're using the starter, the original starter, are you? We're using a starter, yeah. Yeah. Most impressive. It is, it is, it is just incredible to think that that thing flew, what, fif 15 missions, was it? Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, uh, that night in 1943, when it kind of met that ace night fighter, So it may have been, like I was discussing with Dan earlier on, it may have been corkscrewing and... More than likely. Yeah. That was so that's kind why of how they got out of the all, all pilots were trained, you know, that was kind of evasive manoeuvre, mm. textbook evasive manoeuvre. Yeah. And they almost certainly would have tried that. Yes. Yeah. Could have even gone into a rudder stall because uh, this was a Mark II Halifax, was it? It was, yeah. The so Mark II Halifax is the, the only one that had the Merlin engine. Mm, mm. The other Marks of Halifax had, had Bristol Hercules Bristol ra radial yeah. engines. Yes. So uh, there's... And of course there were different rudder different types of rudder on the Mark II to the Mark II, Mark III, the Mark III kind the of pointed yeah, leading yeah. edge. Yeah. Uh, say pointed, it's not drastically pointed. Yes, but it's more triangular say, the Mark, than the other one. The Mark III, for example, had a much straighter yes. vertical rudder. Yes, and they were susceptible, I believe, um, to, uh, I, for, I, for instance, the uh, HR 796, the, the word was that it went into a rudder stall. Yeah. Uh, but that in that in the, in that instance, the uh, you know the, the the crews were given a chance to get out. 
yeah. you know, in yeah. this instance, there's a there's a good possibility that you know the aircraft was shot up extensively and uh, yeah, yeah, and they may not even have you know had much warning. Yes, because um, they were just developing, I think, the upward firing technique of getting underneath the bombers Shrug and firing music, upwards. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. The ME one tens, wasn't it? But, yeah, um, great shame. That was just coming into play when this was shot down. So. Yeah. And of course, a lot of the uh, some of the some of the uh, the German crews were uh, sympathetic. They shoot the uh, shoot the fuel tanks out. Yeah. Uh, let the bomber crews get out. You know, others would go straight for the bomb yeah. base. Uh, in which case there'd be no chance. No. But the fact that this was this has gone straight down, it's uh, yeah. We, we can we can more or less be sure combat. that you know <coughs> they haven't shot the bomb load out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the bomb load was still with the aircraft when it was found in Germany mm -hmm. and, and had to be defused. So the, the, the bomb load that did go up probably went up on impact rather than being yes. part of the uh, shot shooting down process. Yeah, that's fuel and oil. That's fuel, that's oil. Oh, and that's water lines. Let's just have a little look down on the other side. Yeah, that's how many times have we run it, then? I lose track. Um, you want to stay on this side, just so I can get your audio. Thing. Yeah. Oh, you've, you've, you've run it quite a few times, then, yeah? Yes. Yeah, and then we have to do test runs and things. Make sure everything's working. Yes, yes. <laughs> and also, you know, we've been ironing out sort of small technical bits and pieces as we go along. I guess you're sort of like wearing your in again, aren't you? Yeah, the first not, is it the original pistons? And, uh, yes, it is. Is yeah. it really? Yeah. So the first couple of times we run it, yeah. we were getting quite a lot of oil and smoke coming back. And when you when you took the goggles off, you know, you were sort of left with a, a clear ring where the goggles were and the rest yes. of your face was splattered with oil. Um, but it's improved a lot, as, yes. it, as it's kind of like everything's bedding in again now. Yes, of course. And the more you yeah. run it, the more it kind of beds in. Yes. It is incredible, you're using all, almost all the, all, the, all the original internals as well. Yeah. <laughs> Just well, the internals testament were, to Rolls-Royce, isn't it, really? It is, yeah. And they were quite well preserved because they still had the original oil inside the engine. Yeah, yeah. So that helps to, you know, with the, keep the corrosion at bay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well preserved because yeah. they were in a bog as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, we I think that's um it, it, that that on the on the on the front of the hub, is that a counterbalance? Is that some kind of a balance? Yeah. On the on the on that, the very front of the hub there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're not really using any of that kind of mechanism at the moment. Yes. Yeah. But it yeah. is original to the JD150. Yes. So we're not sure what's actually inside that. Well, it has been a part, but I didn't take it apart. Okay. I've been but all the feathering <laughs> mechanisms and so on and so forth are actually inside the hub, Te aren't Technically, they? that could still work, yeah, but it's yeah. currently, as I said before, yeah. fixed because the last thing we want is to take a massive bite of air. Yes. And no, sort of the engine is then going to want to fly. Yeah, it's going to want to move forward at least. Of course it will. So I hope that answers your question, Adrian. Um, and what's the normal starting procedure then, Kevin? Well, just make sure fuel's on. Uh, we have to give a little prime of the oil to start with so that we've got, we know there's oil in the engine. Once the engine kicks in, its own pump will sort out, keeping the oil circulating. Um, make sure we prime the engine and then um, a little bit of quarter inch of throttle. Then start both magnetos. <laughs> and make sure that after it kicks in that the oil pressure is rising very quickly and if, if the oil pressure gauge doesn't start rising then we have to shut it down oh really there's a problem okay because obviously if you haven't got oil pressure then you've got a problem with oil circulation and the engine could potentially seize quite quickly if you yes. continue to run it yes 
Is that something that comes up pretty quick? The uh, the oil pressure. Yeah, you've, yeah. Got a, you've got a, 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 a you've got an indicator on the on the panel, haven't you? We have, yeah. Okay, let's just have a little look at that. So again, this is something that was um, created by uh, one of your uh, your crew. Is that right? Yeah. So this this is the oil pressure gauge, and as soon as the engine kicks in, we would expect that to start rising very quickly within a few seconds. Yes. If it doesn't rise, or if it doesn't get up to, say, 70 um, in about 10 or 20 seconds, then we would start to be a bit concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what we'll find is that the, the, um, the pressure will rise quite a lot to begin with. And then as the engine warms up, and we've done a bit of you know, 2,000 RPM for a while, and the oil kind of warms up and starts coming um, thinner, if you like, yeah, then the, the, the pressure will start to drop again. Yeah, obviously it won't drop a, right a down, but it'll stabilise. <laughs> I think we're getting a little bit too much interference with, with the other guy talking. Is that right, Billy? Or are we all right? Are we all right? Or just um, a lot of people talking all at once. No, is it all right? Okay, okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that's good then. That's good. Okay. So the other thing that governs the length of time that we run this engine is the um, radiator temperature because generally if it gets up to 100 I will shut it down because the Merlins were renowned for on the ground overheating quite quickly. Right, because uh, they without, need without motion slipstream. With the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and obviously although we've got a propeller we've got a kind of reduced diminished propeller yes and we so haven't got perhaps no quite as efficient system yeah. as it would have had in the aircraft so for safety of the engine's sake if you like when it gets to 100 we'll generally shut it down right so it doesn't overheat yeah yeah but as it is at the moment it's it's behaved itself yes yeah incredible Absolutely incredible because I remember when these en <laughs> I remember when these engines came in here. Yeah. And I actually ha I, I jet washed one of them myself, um, which was a pleasure to do. Yeah, but you probably didn't think then that it would end up running. No, just incredible. <laughs> Such an impressive engine. And of course, uh, what you could say is that uh, the Merlin won the war. Really, I mean, obviously not this variant of it because there are so many. There were more more variants of it later on. I mean, I don't know what whether it was the double X that was used in the Spitfire or uh, it was used in the Spitfire. It was also used in the Lancaster yes. as well. Yes, of course, um, of course yeah. yeah. Famous. So used you know, Rolls Royce Lancaster. must have been. Under, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Rolls Royce must have been under tremendous pressure to get enough engines out to power all these different aircraft types. Which is why they were made in uh, Canada as well. Yes, that's right. We might be uh, getting towards the, uh, the moment of truth, so to speak. Yeah. I believe you've got a uh, um, one of the one of the vets uh, actually likes to fire it up. Well, George Dunn, who was a um, Halifax pilot, uh, we normally get him to press the start buttons. It's kind of poignant because it's kind of what he would have done in the aircraft. Is he Mark II or Mark III? Pilot? I think he was actually Mark III. Okay. Check with him later. But yeah. Even so, still the same startup procedure. Very, you know. very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not exactly the same. Yeah. So you've got a fuel primer and a button there for the boost coil as well. Yeah, we don't really use the boost coil so much. Yeah. Um, we don't really need to. You just use the throttle? We use the fuel primer. Right. And then we, we'll use, um, obviously you've got a, a mixture control here and the throttle here. But we're not really we're not really doing much movement on the throttle because we can't push it to the gate as it were. Yeah, yeah. Which it would have been on takeoff power. And ma magneto switches as well. Yep. Same, exactly the same. Well, all, all of the instruments on there are kind of original instruments yes. that would have been in the aircraft. So what you're basically doing is just simulating sort of like a ground run 
engine test yeah, up it, yeah. as far as you can go. Yeah, using original instruments, obviously they're not out of this Halifax. Yeah. They're not even necessarily out of a Halifax, yes. but they are original World War II instruments, yes. exactly the same as they would have been in the panel of JD-150. But for each um, radiator and oil pressure and boost gauge, there would have been four of four them in a the row, yes. obviously yeah. for four engines. Yes. yes. And of course, the flight engineer would have had a, a row of boost gauges as well as the, yeah, uh, the pilot flight, would have seen them as well. That's right. I mean, the flight engineer would have done a lot of the um, engine management, well, all of the engine management during yeah. the flight, managing fuel. His responsibility was to um, switch between fuel tanks now and then so that you're using fuel equally from around the different tanks situated in the aircraft. But you don't want to use it all from one side and then you'll end up kind of one side heavy. Yes. So they try try to equalise and they can yes. also transfer fuel. Say for example they had a fuel tank that was uh, punctured uh, by shrapnel or a bullet or something like that. Yes. To a certain extent they could transfer fuel from that tank into one of the other tanks. Yes. <laughs> to try and save as much fuel as possible before it leaked out. Yes. Yeah. And all that in um, sometimes in combat situations as well. Which is, you know, uh, one thing we haven't got to worry about today is any kind of enemy activity or or even if the engine was to quit on us, you yeah. know, we're not yeah. going down, are we? Yeah. Just you no. Know, just uh, shut the engine down and uh, carry on with the, uh, carry on with the Find other. Find out what's happened and fix it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what time are we planning to? Uh, half past. So very half soon. Past, so very soon. Yeah. So what I'd like to try and do, if I can, is uh, sort of like stay on this side so I can see your startup procedure. Yeah. If you could make sure that you stay well back from the prop. Yeah. And just also bear in mind. It shouldn't happen, but if the prop was to pick a stone up, it could chuck it to one side. Yes, yes. I, I think it's more likely to chuck it against the building there. Yeah, but yeah. Just be aware that it's yeah, I'm going to be quite far over there because I can get a good zoom. Yeah. I'm probably going to be somewhere around about here, I'd imagine. Yeah. Extremely, extremely hot, hot yeah. But Although she we've probably a lot of ting -tong noises. she will, yes. Yeah, lots yeah. of lots of those kind of noises, yeah. and you'll see kind of like heat shimmers coming from it. Yeah. But although we're only running it for about four minutes, you know, they will get hot. It's incredible to think that they went out on like 12-hour missions and, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At power as well, you know. Well, so. although those exhausts suppressed flame, I believe that um, under combat conditions, they could still potentially get so hot that they glowed in the dark a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it is the ultimate, I uh, don't like to use the word boys toy, but it is the ultimate, uh, you know, it's like having a historic car, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and lovingly restoring that vehicle and then um, being able to, uh, being able to run it. Yeah, I mean, being able to sort of experience the sound, the smell, yes. Yes. you know, even the bits, like you said, about the ting-ting from the exhaust when it shuts down. Yes. You can just imagine that after a 12-hour mission or whatever, and they finally arrived back at dispersal and shut the engines down, that noise must have been quite yes. welcoming. And think. eerie, because um, once the last aircraft shuts all its engines down, it's complete silence, isn't it? Yeah. A bomber base would be, you know, just, just, just a noise. A, just a, a, a cacophony of engine noise, yeah. and then uh, and then nothing. Yeah. Just uh, just the early morning uh, early morning bird song, maybe because they would arrive back early morning, wouldn't they? Yeah. And they would a lot of the race. Course, all go to a debriefing hut somewhere and have a coffee and a yeah. and yeah. a debrief. Yes. Before they were and allowed a, to go to bed. About twenty fags. Probably, the time yeah. They even got there. Well, I'm not sure if they weren't offered a stiff drink as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think they did actually get. Uh, they were given a tod of whiskey in uh, in their tea, weren't they? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and you can see from a lot of those. Uh, so that I've, I've read a lot of books and seen a lot of images, and some of the uh, images of crews that have just re returned back off of a mission are just uh, so tired. Yeah. Um, 
and probably grateful well, that they've made it back. Well, they weren't the most comfortable of places to sit for that long. No. no you know, comfort comfort was quite um, rudimental, really. Yeah. Especially for the rear gun, freezing conditions. I mean, even with a heated suit, just... Yeah, and I, I don't know, you know how you could sit in one position like that for so long. It was such a cramped, confined yeah. space as well. Knowing that, you know, yeah. you're the, you've got a big target written on the back of you, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Or on the front of you, if you're the rear gunner. Okay, it looks like we are uh, ready to rock and roll. I'm leave this mic, Jilly, so I've got a more of a... Okay, I'm going to let you the could, guys get on. Jilly. And where are they? One, so, of, one, of um, the, um, one of the old boys has just gone to the toilets. <laughs> so, uh, I'll just get me in. Okay, so what we're waiting for now, folks, is the uh, is the bomber crews to um, the, bom the bomber boys who are here today. It's just. What's that he just put in there then, Kevin? This thing. This is an emergency kill switch. Ah, right, okay. So if I yeah. click that, everything will... So that's when you see your radiator temperature going too high or... Well, I'll try and shut it down the conventional way, but this right. is like an Okay, so that's, an, oh, that, that's a, a complete kill switch. switch. Yeah, yeah right, I see. I see. Dead. Yes. For safety reasons. Yes, of course, yeah. Is that priming it? Yeah, it gets the pressure obviously because it's, it's um, uh, a dry sump. You need to build the pressure up before you fire it out to knock a big end out or something. You yes. Let's take a bit of a look. And all your batteries in, are in here, I guess. Two so. batteries. Oh, okay. They come the gents now. This is our. Uh, Did I wear them before? You did. Yeah. I think you did. Yeah. We don't need to put them on until we actually start. Oh, but yeah. it's just a bit loud, that's all. Yeah. So when we do, when we do the reading, is it before? Before, oh, yeah. 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 So uh, George will do a reading, um, basically. Um, a short brief history of JD150 and the crew. It's um. What's his name? Bell. Oh, he, he had a bit. Somebody said he had a bit of a tumble. Yeah, no, he had a, he had a, a stroke oh. when we were up at Duxford, oh. which uh, involved a bleeding on the brain. Oh, and he's had an operation. He's he's up and about, but last night he had a bad night. Apparently, with the, it looks like it might be gout. Um, he rang Cherry at ten to eight this morning mm. to say that. Uh, He'd had a bad night, and he got these all these shooting pains up his up his leg from his feet. Mm. So obviously he's not been over the. Because I took him home last year because he apparently whoever bought him couldn't pick him up, and he was trying to get a taxi. I said, "No, get a taxi." I said, "Look, where you going? Where do you live?" He said, "Stonehenge." I said, "Well, I know the RF place. He said, "That's where I live." I said, "Well, I'm going past there." As it happened, I was going to work in that night anyway. So I went. Yeah, 
original group that we had in 2009, which was about 14, we're down to about three now. No, as many as that. Quite a few. Quite a few. So when we start the when you press the buttons, I'll be ready with the primer in case we need to get these two is it? Yeah. Those two. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, on the night of July 28, 1943, the crew of Hanley Page Halifax serial number JD150 took off from RAF Puckington in Yorkshire to bomb Hamburg in Germany. At approximately 1.01am the aircraft drifted away slightly from the main bomber stream and was coned in searchlights. Almost immediately the aircraft was attacked by an ME110 German night fighter and JD-150 was set on fire. The young crew battled with their stricken aircraft, finally losing that battle and crashing in the hamlet of Rendsburg in Germany. Tragically, the crew perished. In 2010, the German authorities were working at the crash site to clear unexploded bombs. During their work, Four Rolls Royce Merlin Mark 22 engines and a number of incendiary bombs and other wreckage was recovered. The engines were offered to the Wings Museum or they will be scrapped. The Wings Museum liaised with both the Ministry of Defence and the Berlin Embassy to bring these engines back to England. One of those Merlin engines has now been painstakingly restored to run again. The original saxophone style exhausts give the sound of the mighty Halifax bomber, a sound not heard for 75 years. The names of the crew of JD-150 were as follows. Pilot Sergeant Gordon Harry Brown, age 19. Navigator Flying Officer William Joseph John Hitchcock, age 32. Wireless Operator, Sergeant James Wesley Rook, age 22. Air Gunner, Sergeant Edward Goff, age not known. Air Gunner, Sergeant William Roy Sinclair, age 22. Flight Engineer, Sergeant John Alfred Tyler, age 25, and bomb aimer, flying officer Robert William Allison, age 22. We will, we'll remember them. We will remember them.
can't hear very well, but another clap for George Dunn, please. Yeah. Yeah. The afternoon one will run smoother now. <laughs> Okay, folks, I'm just going to try and get a, a, a couple of words with George. George, absolute honour, sir, to, uh, to meet with you. And uh, you, are li you are live across the world right now. <laughs> <laughs> How absolutely fantastic. So um, if you could just uh, tell us, what, what's, uh, which squadron did, we, did you fly with? Was it um, uh, Mark III Halifax squadron? No, Mark II. Uh, I did two second pilot trips on uh, 10 squadron. Each, uh, every pilot had to do two trips with an experienced crew before they were allowed to take their own crew. And I did those at uh, 10 Squadron at Melbourne. And then uh, after my heavy conversion unit on the Halifaxes, uh, uh, I started off with 76 Squadron at Linton on Ouse. And then uh, we got, uh, when they formed the Canadian Six Group, uh, they gave them all the peacetime stations and we were kicked out to uh, something a little bit down the lower grade in, ha in Nissen Huts. That was at Holmes Spalding Moor, still in Yorkshire. Yes. Yeah. And so the, uh, the Halifax bomber itself, um, obviously uh, a, a, a very um, sturdy aircraft. Yes, yeah. It was a, a very good aircraft. Not as powerful uh, as, as the Lancaster. Uh, but uh, even so, it was, uh, and I didn't, I didn't have any problems with it at all. It, she was able to withstand quite a lot of. Um... Yeah. Yes. Yes. No doubt about that. It it, it didn't get the credit it uh, it should have had the Halifax, but of course uh, there you are. It, it it did a it did a very good job with with bomb and command. So how many missions did you fly with uh, with your squadrons? With Halifaxes, I flew 30. Uh, and all into enemy territory? Into, nearly, all, into... nearly all. Most of my trips were to the Ruhr. Uh, uh, I did one trip to Italy, to Milan, and uh, one to uh, Berlin in Halifax. And then as a second tour, I went on to uh, Mosquitoes. So your um, so your missions uh, all at night and uh, all at night, yeah, and 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 taking off with all of your um, all of your your pals and other colleagues uh, who flew in those in, on those missions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you did you have any um, instances where you were uh, under attack or, or had to corkscrew? No, we were very lucky. We we got hit by by flak a couple of times, but uh, we didn't have any problems with night fighters. Uh, we did get coned once with uh, searchlights, which involved uh, quite a lot of manoeuvring to get out of the cone. But other than that, no, we had uh, we had quite a good tour. I mean, uh, there were some hairy moments, but uh, uh, we didn't get any serious damage. Of course, a lot of the time, you being a pilot, um, I did I did hear reports that the Halifax was prone to swinging on takeoff. Was that was that no, not no 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 no? no. Okay. Well, you only speak from personal, uh, you know, from personal experience, and I didn't have any problem with it. But it was the it was the mo it was one of the most um, uh, 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 um, uh, dangerous points of, of a mission was t actually taking off with a full bomb load, a full it's, fuel it, load. It certainly was, uh, until you reach what they called safety speed, uh, anything could happen, which was usually about 120 miles an hour. Once you got to that, then uh, uh, that you felt you were okay. And your crew, um, we just heard today, JD-150 had a very young crew, a, yeah. pilot, uh, a, a pilot, a captain who was just 19 years of age. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the age of your crew? Well, uh, my rear gunner was the youngest, he was 19. Bob Aimer and myself were 20. Uh, and then we had a gap between uh, the rest of the crew, were sort of um, 27, 28, 30. So that's there was there was a gap between. But that's incredible. A, a twenty-year-old uh, uh, commanding a, 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 an aircraft with twenty-seven-year-olds. I but, know. But back then it was, I think, a little bit different. That people respected each other, didn't they? Oh yes. I mean, basically, it was it was teamwork. 
if you if you if you relied on uh, everybody relied on the other chap to do his job properly, and that I think made all the difference to getting through uh, a tour. Yes, and and you flew with the same crew right the way through the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Occasionally you had a different uh, gunner or navigator, perhaps uh, due sickness or something like that. But basically, the same crew the whole time. And your life on the station itself was uh, was. Um, oh. We we we. I've read stories of, of hitting the pub every time you you got back, uh, seeing yeah. if you could get back in time for the before the pubs close. Yeah, well, we were lucky because uh, my flight engineer, his wife and his mother run a pub, <laughs> so and he also ran. Uh, he also owned a car, a Morris Eight. So we used to seven of us used to pile in the Morris Eight on nights off, and drive over to Horsforth near Leeds to have a, a session at the, the pub was called the Old Ball. Absolutely yeah. fantastic, and uh, and and in those days you'd had a few drinks and you'd drive back. Uh, yeah, no, nobody worried in those days. No, uh, it, I mean as far as the driver, he was pretty good. He was pretty careful. Yes, he was. <clears throat> he was the flight engineer. Right, yeah. so he was a sensible one. Yeah, I? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, those the the, the, the the crew themselves, especially the uh, especially the navigator, such a such a um, a lot of pressure on his shoulders to, to oh absolutely to, get you to the target in Absol the dark. Absolutely, I mean we did have um, uh, what they called a G box, which was a radar assisted uh, um, aid. And uh, that, of course, made all the difference. But of course, you did get uh, t that would only operate uh, to about five degrees east. So then, of course, it was dead reckoning navigation. Yeah, you know, I had a very good navigator, excellent. Which was, uh, you know, a, a, a good thing for, for uh, because I I did hear a lot of stories of. Uh, Navigators who would get their crew lost and uh, yeah, would, yeah. Um, sometimes make it back, sometimes not. Yeah. So, your last mission, where was your last mission? Do you My remember? last mission was uh, to a place called uh, Castle, which was in the, near the Ruhr. And that was, uh, we, we were hoping that uh, we would get a fairly, what, what you might call an easy trip, but it wasn't. In actual fact, we lost over four, 46 aircraft on my last uh, on my last mission. We lost four four aircraft from our squadron. So, so when you got back, it was a, a sigh of relief. Yeah, absolutely. And what did you do after your uh, after you completed your 30? Uh, went uh, back to an OTU instructor on Wellingtons, and then um, after about a year on that. Uh, uh, volunteered to go back and do a second tour on mosquitoes. Did you really? Yeah. And you did. Uh, half halfway through uh, the tour when the war finished. So yeah. wow, flew you flew the mosquito. Yeah. With your with your it was a it was a navigator who's just sat right next to you, wasn't it? That's right. Very, yeah. Very just tight. just the two of us. Oh yes, there wasn't very much room. Yeah, and a very uh, was that was that low uh, 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 low bombing missions or no, oh, well over twenty thousand, twenty six thousand. Wow. Yeah. So not not much of a bomb load on the mosquito. Four five hundreds. Yeah. So uh, precision bombing. Yeah, it was to keep the bur. I was doing Berlin mostly, and it was just to keep the Berliners on their toes, you know, and of course it occupied. It occupied people that otherwise might have been fighting on the fronts or something like that. Yes, yes. Well, uh, George, thank you so much. Uh, I, we can't thank you enough for, right. for your kind words and, and for your dedication and commitment. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And what was it like just firing up this engine again? Oh, because I've done it before when I first did it. It's great to hear that noise of the old Merlin. Yeah, you never forget that. Never forget that. And no. Of course, you were the man who pressed those buttons at yeah. the beginning of every mission to, That's right. to start those engines. Yeah. And of course, your ground crew were important too. Oh, well. absolutely. We had a marvellous ground crew. Uh, they were very, very thorough in their work, and they they looked after their crews. And they looked after their aircraft like it was their own. Yes. Yeah. They, if you if you brought an aircraft back with a hole in it, you were in trouble. <laughs> 
George, thank you so much. Okay, pleasure. Okay. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. Okay, so here's your Lancaster bomber. We'll be coming to that in a short while. Before we uh, come round to the Lank, let's just uh, have a little walk around the bomber hall. B-24 Liberator. Right there. She's a beauty. The Harvard, which was, I believe, uh, one of the training aircraft mainly used. Oh, it's the Oxford, my apologies. Of course, the Blenheim, which was uh, developed into a night fighter, short, short bomber, short range bomber. Bristol Blenheim. Of course, they've got a. Um, how's the audio, Jilly? Is it not too? It's not too in your face, so to speak, is it? Yeah, we got it. Okay, so they developed that into a night fighter later on in the war. A couple of big air-cooled engines. Bristol Mercuries. Obviously, some manufacturer, some uh, developers, aircraft manufacturers favouring the water, the air-cooled or water-cooled engines. So what we'll do is we'll move around here. Decent sized Bombay. Not too easy to see inside the aircraft. Bomb aimers sight right there. Now if we can get a good close up of that or not really. Entered the, the war really early, around about 19 actually when i say entered the war actually entered service in around about 1937 so uh one of the very early developed bombers um only twin engine bombers at this time and then of course the uh, air ministry calling on um, designers to develop long-range bombers in the need for possibly uh increasing their range at a later date so, let's just, uh, as we walk around here, they've moved, uh, Hendon have moved uh, a lot of their aircraft into uh, this hall, and uh, impressively, and one of these things that, if you look at, just have a look at scale here, look at the size of that Stuka dive bomber over there. These are all... Um, These are not replicas, folks. These are actual aircraft. Heinkel HE-111. That was the only real um, heavy bomber that the Germans had, of course. Twin-engined only. And these engines on the Heinkel, I seem to remember, are actually... Uh, as, as with a lot of the German aircraft, were actually upside down. They were inverted engines. See the air intakes? So, Stuka, with its uh, classic wing profile. And that noise that, uh, that they used to have um, when they were diving was actually... Uh, Apparently, I don't think it's a myth, but apparently they actually built something in to scare people with. <laughs> get a good, let's see if we can get a good look in that bomb aimer's position right there. A 
from memory, I think they just had one pilot on board the uh, the 111. There's his. Uh, you just about see the um, the stick there, the column. Just the one column. Big chunky wing. Look how deep that wing is. Obviously to store the fuel. Of course. Uh, belly, uh, I'd imagine a belly gunner, whether that was radio controlled or not, I don't know. But uh, radio controlled, obviously very, very early development back in 39. Pretty primitive design, but uh, effective. Mostly used, obviously, in the Battle of Britain. Um, So, that's your German long-range bomber. Now, this one here, this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting find, I should say. Um, you can just about see, this is a Halifax bomber. It's a Mark II. Um, you can just about see the TL markings on the side there. That uh, signifies the um, squadron. Uh, this was 35 squadron. And uh, 35 Squadron was actually led by Leonard Cheshire, who was the um, was to become the uh, leader of the Pathfinders. And then uh, later on, of course, um, after unfortunately Guy Gibson losing his life on returning back in his Mosquito, um, Leonard Cheshire uh, was to take over the Dambuster Squadron uh, 617. Now this aircraft in particular, you can see obviously it is a wreck. This was literally pulled off the lake bed of a Norwegian lake uh, after it was on a raid to the Tirpitz. Uh, obviously the RAF carried out a number of, different, a number of raids on the Tirpitz to try and, uh, whilst it was um, in a Norwegian field, um, no jokes please, and of course um, it landed, the pilot successfully landed it on a lake. Um, it was shot, uh, it was obviously hit by flak. And uh, what is amazing is uh, he managed to land it on the lake, but obviously during the uh, warmer months when the lake, uh, when the ice dispersed, the aircraft sank to the bottom. And there it stayed right up until around about the 70s, I believe, somewhere, somewhere then uh, where it was recovered and um, successfully recovered and brought here to Hendon. Now you can see here, this is the, uh, this is the fuel tank area, the outboard fuel tanks, where the, um, where the flak successfully hit the aircraft and burnt the wing. He obviously uh, managed to bring the aircraft down, land it on the lake, but uh, as you can see, caused a huge amount of damage, uh, the wing, obviously burnt off and uh, dislodged itself and that's the uh, the remnants of the wing right there let's just have a little look here this is the kind of damage that you'd see inflicted on uh, on aircraft after a raid these guys obviously very very lucky indeed to get out it's a seven-man crew there fellas that's uh, that's probably the, uh, the ground crew. Each aircraft assigned its own ground crew um, at the squadron break base. You can see this, Lanc this um, Halifax bomber has uh, successfully made it back to base. Looks like a Mark II there with the D fins on it. So, as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of damage caused by that flak. So as we come around the front end, now they've um, obviously we've lost We've lost the outboard engine, as you can see. Now this is uh, this engine was actually from this aircraft, taken the Merlin Double X, taken um, and restored by a uh, restoration group. What's interesting, as you can see here, uh, the Air Ministry um, uh, and different designers worked on a number of different 
ways to um, reduce the amount of flame that came out of the exhausts. And uh, this is one of the way the trumpet exhaust, um, which was uh, created to minimize the amount of flame that came out so that the, uh, the, the night fighters couldn't see it, as you can see there. A very sort of like uh, minimal amount of um, exhaust flame coming out of the engine so that they weren't visible of course so beautifully restored that Merlin double X and as you can see um, because of the exposure of the uh, of the wings we'll probably be able to see it better around the other side but look at the um, all the um, engine controls for the carburation um, adjustment controls and obviously you can just about see no you can't see it unfortunately I can't now what is a shame I might have to come back to this because they do have lighting on this aircraft so uh, we'll try and see if we can get the lights on in here because that is a pretty impressive uh, cockpit to look at when the lights are on Handley Page Victor as we all know Handley Page building this Halifax so you can see the uh, front turret there bomb aimers position right there that's where the uh, wireless operator would have sat right in there you can see how small yeah we'll probably get a, a quite a uh, quite a bad um, we're at the worst side of the of the museum at the moment, Jelly, just for uh, in terms of uh, reception. Okay, so you can see the uh, this was before the aluminium uh, props were uh, brought into service. Wooden props originally on these uh, Mark II Halifaxes. In fact, all the Halifaxes only having wooden props. These are the engines as they were as they were brought off the lake. And you can see. A little bit clearer the uh, the exhaust you see he did a great job bringing this aircraft down because there's actually a crease in the uh, in the fuselage there as well Bakelite that's the uh, that's actually a very early turret up there as well mid upper gunner turret And that's for uh, the wireless. Early aircraft obviously had a, uh, a line that um, ran right the way across from the uh, from that position up to the tailplane. But these uh, later aircraft, slightly later aircraft, this is sort of like between a Mark One and a Mark Two. Oh, that's a nice noise. <laughs> okay, so that's actually as she was brought off the lake, folks really impressive sort of like a display of a wreck and of course as we all know the history of the Tirpitz um, eventually brought down by Cheshire and his crew uh, with the Tallboy bomb taking out the, um, the Tirpitz so moving on the Liberator probably after the B-17 one of the finest um, and most successful four engine heavy bombers of the uh, US Air Force. Of course used by the British as well. Um, and of course the Americans only doing the daytime raids whereas the uh, Americans, uh, the British doing the night raids. It's one presented by the Indian Air Force to the RAF Museum, how about that? That's pretty impressive. I'd imagine air-cooled radials once again. Not the biggest of uh, the American bombers were never known for their huge bomb carrying capacity. Uh, the Liberator having these side bomb uh, stows, which uh, as you can see there where the side bomb doors would open and the bombs would drop from a vertical position. 
side uh, undercarriage folding up into the wing as opposed to into its own uh, its own bay underneath the underneath the engine nacelle. These are proper cannons up the front here. Americans, um, I think most of the American uh, armory was uh, was cannon rather than the 22. You can see how small the uh, the cockpit is there, which is um, so visibility. I'd imagine when taxiing was probably quite uh, quite dodgy of course what's interesting about this aircraft as you can see is uh, she is the front she has a nose wheel as opposed to most of the bombers of the era uh, having a rear wheel so uh, she was a nose wheel steer decent enough wingspan For anyone who likes their tractors, this is the sort of thing that you would see on the airfield, towing the uh, the bomb tally out to the aircraft. Lovely old thing that. I guess there's a lot of people who watch Big Jet TV who say like their tractors. Nice bit of nose art there. Of course, uh, nose art was one of the uh, one of the things that sort of like. Um, the squadrons worked on their individual aircraft. Um, this is a very famous one. I'll just show you this quickly. That was a very fra famous one on a Halifax Friday the 13th. That's actually that actually made it through the war as well. And unfortunately, um, all that remains of that Halifax is literally um, the bomb tally and her nose art. You can just see there. That's the. Um, squadron um, medals so to speak that the uh, the pilot would have worn on his uh, on his tunic that's uh, that's actually the window of the uh, radio operator believe it or not so here we go then All right let's just move around here to before we make our way up to the Vulcan uh, and back to the Halifax still got good feed there Jilly okay see what I'm going to do quick that's it now here we go this is an interesting uh, an interesting aircraft now this was kind of the scourge of Bomber Command and uh, when you look at it in scale to the um to the bombers is actually uh, a significant aircraft. The BF-110, uh, she's, a, she's a night fighter, um, interceptor, and um, it wasn't until after the war that uh, they actually found out that the, the reason why so many of the uh, bombers um, were suddenly um, blown up without any notice at all even though uh, later on in the war they had uh, what was called the AGL which was the automatic gun laying turret on the Lancasters uh, to detect aircraft uh, night fighters and uh, night interceptors uh, coming at them so they'd at least get some um, warning however um, these particular aircraft the, the 110 had what was called the uh, Shrog music which is an upward firing cannon and it's as simple as that a really unfair way of taking them down and uh, of course all they do is they creep up underneath the bomb bay of uh, a Lancaster or creep up underneath a Lancaster I'm not saying that um, uh, all ME 110 pilots did it some of them um, were sympathetic to the bomber crews because obviously they were all um, they were all heroes in their own right, and um, some of the um, some of the fighter the, these night fighter pilots would creep up and make sure that they were under the wing of the of of the bomber and shoot the wing out so that the uh, so that and and uh, a puncture the fuel tanks 
um, and then at least give the, um, the crews some chance of escaping and uh, parachuting to safety if they could. Um, so, you know, some sympathetic uh, night fighter pilots, others were less sympathetic. Of course, as you can see, she's quite a big aircraft and uh, this is a beautiful example, it has to be said. Like I said, scourge of bomber command, literally. Um, and of course, that very much, very similar model to the JU-88 um, bomber with um, the uh, Luftwaffe back in those days. So, just have a quick switch around here. Now, I know we're talking about bombers, folks, but um, this particular aircraft here, the Mustang, um, the P-51, uh, beautiful aircraft and a beautiful um, example of her here at London Hendon. And um, of course, uh, later on in the war, um, Leonard Cheshire uh, actually preferred, this was his preferred aircraft as uh, using it for, um, for pathfinding and actually marking the target uh, for the bomber forces before they came in. So uh, powered by, of course, the Rolls-Royce engine, uh, very famous air, uh, engine during the war. Now, just quick, let's just move around to this one here, which uh, is again a big favorite amongst people. Just show this, sir. Uh, this is a Merlin double X powering most of, the, uh, most of the, the big aircraft back in the day, the Lancaster heavy, uh, four engine heavy bomber. Of course, the Halifaxes. And of course the uh, Mustang, uh, the Mustang, the Spitfire, and the Hurricane. And of course this one here as well, the Mosquito. Again, um, extremely lightweight aircraft, literally built out of wood. Can you believe it? So light, uh, power to weight. It very easily repaired, of course, if they ever came back with damage. Guy Gibson used this aircraft. Uh, later on in the war and of course uh, went missing on one of these mosquitoes later on in the war which was a great shame. Decent enough bomb load, they would um, sort of like an in-out bomber where they would um, low, low altitude, high speed bombing runs, um, get in and get out. The size of these props folks. Tiny little bomb aimers position right down there. Of course, uh, two-man crew on the Mosquito, and the flight uh, the the, the uh, flight engineer would also um, pair as the uh, as the bomb aimer as well. As you can see, I don't know if you can see through there, but it's uh, extremely tight in there to be able to uh, squeeze down into the bomb aiming position, lie down, and uh, release your bombs. Of course, some of them did it without the bomb aimer, and uh, as we've seen in some of the movies, would literally use a bomb teat inside the, uh, the captain's compartment. Such an impressive aircraft, and of course, um, a great example of this aircraft right here at Hendon. Lovely little car, which uh, a lot of the flight crews um, used to um, buy whilst they were on station. Very cheap money, of course, uh, try and cram like seven, seven of them all into one car and uh, head down to the local pub uh, and of course drive back completely um, blitzed. Back in the day when uh, the, local, the local cops would just be like, go on in Sonny, just uh, get on your way there Sonny, make sure you're up in the morning. Because literally every day uh, was a miracle for these guys who flew in these aircraft folks literally a miracle making it through um, they had most of the bomber state bomber crews had to uh, had to go through 30 operations 30 night operations before um, before being retired out of the, uh, the Air Force but then it would uh, a lot of them would return we're coming back to uh, this beautiful Lancaster in a short while. Let's just move around. Okay, here we go. Again, the Mosquito. Oh, sorry, the Mustang. 
huge great air intake underneath her belly. Beautiful example, beautifully polished. And right behind her, as you can see, this is the Americans uh, four engine heavy, the B-17 Flying Fortress. Why did they call her the Flying Fortress? Nicknamed her the Flying Fortress, so to speak, um, because she was literally, um, she had an armory unlike any other aircraft. Uh, two waste gunners, either side at the back, 10 man crew, two waste gunners. Um, this one here would be operated, this gun turret here would be operated up front by this chap. There's a bomb aimer's position right there, Norton bomb site. Again, not the biggest and heaviest load of bombs on board the aircraft, but uh, they preferred to do things more in numbers than, um, than single aircraft, so they would fly in huge formations mainly from, um, from Norfolk, the airfields in Norfolk, because it was so flat out there. Of course, uh, our boys stationed in, uh, in airfields out up in Lincolnshire, but these boys would fly out of Norfolk and some down actually in the New Forest, a couple of stations down in the New Forest, but predominantly um, she was, uh, these aircraft, just walking up here, excuse me, Predominantly, these aircraft were stationed out in Norfolk. Big set of all uh, air-cooled radials on her as well. <coughs> so you've got a mid-upper turret. I say mid-upper turret, an upper turret. There's your waist gunner position right out the back there. And of course, a tail gunner as well. Later on, um, the tail gunner would become an, uh, a radio controlled or automated gun turret. These things, if you read the books and look at the pictures, these things would come back uh, very resilient. Um, half the tail missing, <laughs> shot up hundreds of holes from cannon fire. Um, such, a, such an impressive aircraft. And of course, um, many of them still surviving, uh, the America taking them back. And uh, there are a lot of them still sitting out there in the desert and a lot of them still being um, restored and flown. And you can fly these in America, fly on board these in America. There's quite a few uh, historians who've restored them and uh, of course brought them back to life as they were back in the day. And of course, we, you, we do see one of these flying in the uh, air displays in the UK. Um, and that's the um, Memphis Bell. Of course, the very famous Memphis Bell. And that one, the Memphis Bell was painted, whereas this one would have been just in her uh, bare metal. You see these panels here at the side, which is quite interesting to see, and I'll show you on the Lancaster in a little while, that these, um, these panels, some of these panels are literally patches that they used to rivet. So sometimes when you can see on these aircraft, you see little patches where it's sort of like, hmm, uh, are they supposed to be there? Well, they were sometimes literally um, created and patched over. So whether these are, um, patches I'm not sure we'll just have a little check around the other side and see whether it's the same on the other side this is the kind of thing that um, the geeks amongst us like to look at <laughs> so let's see if she's uh, she's got patches on the other side she does so therefore they are not patches they were in during manufacture so even so impressive to see very tight compartments and of course the most unfortunate thing uh, with these aircraft when they were shot at and if they went out of control was the G-forces inside the aircraft, very difficult for the crews to get out and bail out. Of course it was uh, always the pilot who would be last to, or tried to be last to leave his ship, um, uh, but it was the, uh, the ball gunner who sometimes um, was... Uh, 
There you go, ball gunner right there. Now, these poor guys, if the hydraulics ever got shot out, and because uh, the only way into the ball turret was uh, through the inside of the aircraft, sometimes these guys would um, get trapped in the ball turret. And of course, um, the rest is history, really. I don't want to go into detail, but um, these poor guys, uh, heroes, every single one of them, um, wouldn't make it when the aircraft obviously either panned if they panned with no hydraulics so uh, no undercarriage they'd have to come down and belly land it just a little look over there okay we got glitching or okay 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 so we have um, I'm I, if I just keep me posted Jilly Okay, so the FW190, the Focke Wolf 190, uh, another they used. Um, they used to have. They did have a long nose Dora, as they were called, um, later on in the war. And uh, the FW190 again, um, an amazing um, fighter, which uh, was again the scourge of the Americans and uh, and the British as well. And of course, these guys, the Americans. <laughs> you know, um, what would you prefer? Would you prefer to go in the daylight um, in huge formations with fighter escort? Of course, the fighter escort would be the uh, would be those particular uh, mosquitoes, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, during the daylight you can see what's going on. You can see your mates getting shot down. At night, you know, um, you just see explosions, whether they're decoys or what, uh, you don't know, but. Uh, it's a bit it's a bit of a difficult one tossing up whether you're going to go daylight or nighttime. Okay, Julie, I'm just walk, making my way around here to the B25 Mitchell bomber. Uh, folks. This is the is it? Okay. So, sorry about any glitching, folks, but uh, we're uh, we're uh, right round the other side of the uh, of the of the museum. So, okay. B24 sorry B25 Mitchell bomber another set of radials and of course uh, nose nose steering on this aircraft medium range bomber with the American Air Force and of course used by the British as well um, later on in the war this is the sort of bomb that you could expect it to uh, to be carrying 2,000 pound high capacity bomb not the biggest of bomb bays as you can see there folks okay now what I'm going to try and do here is uh, make my way around I just won't walk too fast GP waste gunners on the Mitchell and again another uh, rear turret, uh, rear gunner, uh, who would sit up in there and uh, use, the, um, use the guns almost with a, uh, with a yoke, almost like flying an aircraft. So have gun sights and everything there. Let's just have another little look around at the uh, B-17, the Flying Fortress. This is a G, I believe. This is a, a G model. crew door there which we've uh, I don't know if um, how many of you guys have read on read many of the, the books on bomber command and the uh, and the bomber forces during the war but uh, some fascinating stuff and uh, really gives you a perspective on how brave these guys were nice little bit of uh, some of the um, what what is amazing when you look at some of the uh, the materials that they used early on in the war. Uh, Bakelite, of course, was heavily used at this stage, but uh, some of these um, titanium, early forms of titanium, but uh, heat-resistant materials was what they were obviously what was most crucial. As you can see, what's interesting here is you don't have any out, uh, exhaust outlets. They are your exhausts going right the way down to the outlets down there. 
So again, reducing the uh, reducing the um, visibility of the aircraft in terms of uh, night fighters. But of course, these aircraft not flying at night, only flying during the day. Carb carb air intakes, of course. I think you still got good. You're still good. Okay, folks. Well, here we are. Look at this. Okay, so now this particular Lancaster bomber served with 467 Squadron and uh, later with 83 Squadron. She's actually got the 83 Squadron um, PO on her at the moment. And uh, this particular model and particular aircraft was the first ever to. Um, carry out a hundred nighttime missions and as we've seen with the other aircraft um, the other bombers like the B-24 and the, even the Halifax. The Halifax had a decent bomb bay but the B-17 had a very small bomb load that's why they uh, needed to fly them in such huge formations but you can quite clearly see here how big the bomb bay is and uh, how significant she was as an aircraft and later on when um, when she was serving with 83 squadron uh, this was put on the side of the aircraft this is your uh, pretty standard bomb tally look at that for a bomb tally there's your hundred missions DFCs and uh, bars and so on and so forth again on the tunics of the uh, flight crew of, of the of the um, captain the skipper as he was known, no, en no enemy plane will fly over the Reich territory. That's what Hermann Goering actually said, the leader of the Luftwaffe at the time. And of course, uh, <laughs> we soon uh, proved that wrong. Interestingly enough, you see those little um, alloy. They're actually uh, wire cutters for balloons, for um, if they fly through balloon so that's always quite interesting of course once again tiny little cockpit Bolton and Paul I believe uh, front turret bomb aimers position up the front now don't forget folks that uh, the plan is that we'll be going on board these aircraft in future shows with our elite members and uh, bringing you some uh, quite significant uh, and interesting tours on board. Of course, powered by the Merlin Double X. I would say the most successful engine in history in terms of uh, prop aircraft, prop driven aircraft, probably one of the most su uh, successful and one of the most uh, preferred by engine uh, by aircraft designers. And what's interesting about this as well is that this undercarriage, um, and quite a few of you might um, historians might know that uh, these particular tyres, they didn't actually have treaded tyres uh, back in the war. These would have been put on later on uh, with tread on them. But this undercarriage is actually manufactured, I believe, by Doughty. And Doughty are still um, extremely um, active in the aviation industry. And uh, I think you'll even see them on uh, some of the most modern aircraft that we've got out there. Which is uh, really impressive to see. And of course, Doughty also doing the electrics. Now, this is another... Is it Doughty? Now, now, now I'm questioning myself. Okay, I'll have to come back on that one. But what's interesting is you can see the, uh, the, the, the way they've covered the exhaust outlets on these, uh, on these earlier aircraft. The, 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 uh, the, the early versions of these were actually made um, of, a, uh, of material. These, these are steel. Um, you can just about see. Can 
just about to see the uh, the stub, the exhaust stub behind there. Now that was uh, that's obviously to stop the engine, the the, the flame from the uh, exhaust being seen by the enemy night fighters. And of course, the uh, these the names on the uh, on the fronts of on the front of these. Uh, engines and the, on the carburetor uh, on the uh, air, oil cooler intakes i believe um are of course the uh, flying officer mcmanus dfc distinguished flying cross pilot officer tottenham dfc so a lot of these uh, guys receiving the dfc uh either during or after the war So you can see flaps. This is flap down position here. That's where the uh, huge, great, big um, housing bay for the undercarriage at the back. What's interesting as we come back here is the uh, that bulge there underneath the aircraft. That's the uh, H2S dome, which is a very early form of radar, ground radar, which uh, the navigators obviously used um, for pinpointing any positions. Mid upper gunner with a. Um okay, interesting. So you can just about see this is a cookie, what they called a cookie huge great bombs that they drop and of course this aircraft being famous for the dams raids um, they were heavily modified um, literally took out the um, took out the bomb bay uh, doors and um, paneled it and um, reduced the weight took out the mid upper gunner um, I think they even took the uh, the rear gunner position out just to because these these turrets actually weighed a ton, uh, well more than a ton but weighed a lot. Um, that entire assembly would probably reach all the way down to the bottom of the S. Uh, the whole uh, the whole assembly of it obviously it moved in a uh, on its own axis. Huge great big rudders. That's the. Um, that's the max out. That's to stop the uh, rudder from overcompensating. Inspection panels. Trim rudder. And that's just obviously the overcompensate there as well. Bolt and pull mark two. With uh, the two twos uh, later on in the war, these uh, the lanks would uh, be fitted out with the cannon, 50 caliber cannon. You can see how small that uh, tiny little um, position is there. One of the loneliest positions on a on a bomber, apparently um, the rear gunner. The amount of times that the communications would go down and uh, he'd be on his own with no comms uh, for the um, with the guys up front. They're the shoots for this for the cartridges for the empty cartridges. And of course, I might be getting some of my facts wrong, folks. So do I do apologise for that. Um, and I always uh, love to hear um, me being corrected. Again, these are the trims. The elevators, max out trims tabs. Just have another good look at her. Such an impressive aircraft. I mean, she's up. Fair enough. She's up on her uh, her rear wheels being jacked up, so you don't get the sort of like angle, the the the, the true angle of her when she's um, when she's sitting on the ground. But I think I think that's good enough. I think we've got enough there, of course. 
Hope you enjoyed it. And of course, don't forget Hendon Museum, the Royal Air Force Museum at London is where you want to go into your browser uh, to check any information. It's free to enter. There is no charge. Of course, there is a parking lot here. You do have to pay, but it's very reasonable. Um, and they, I just have to say, they've got great markings. The way they've redone the parking lot here, uh, the parking lot markings are very much like taxiways. And uh, someone with a lot of thought, forethought has, has, has gone into doing that, uh, which is quite good fun for the kids like me. <laughs> but anyway.